start recording now. Um, and I will ask you to just hold your questions for the end. As I said, we'll leave um, ample time for you to ask anything. Um, you can also put it in the chat as we go along and we'll make sure to get to it. So um, here we are, it's a 2022 Fellows Application Information Session. Um, Cinder, would you like to go to the next slide? Oh yeah, yep, I, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So just a bit of background on AVAC for those of you who might not be familiar. We imagine that um, folks on the call today sort of have a range of background knowledge about AVAC and the Fellows Program. Um, so AVAC was started uh, by HIV treatment activists looking to really spread and speed the development of prevention HIV vaccines. Today, AVAC's work cuts across many different prevention approaches um, aimed at addressing topics ranging from ethical issues and community involvement in research to strategic rollout of prevention strategies to working on structural issues that inhibit enabling environments for HIV prevention. We work in coalition with different, like with a, with a global partner network that includes civil society, researchers, policymakers, and other folks to develop and execute strategic action plans based on local and national contexts. So one way AVAC works with our global partners is through the AVAC Fellows Program, which is what we're here to discuss today. The AVAC uh, Advocacy Fellows Program was launched in 2009. And you can see here um, a definition of sort of what, what our main aim is. So we say it fosters a network of deeply informed, skilled, and confident advocates to strengthen and expand advocacy for HIV prevention locally, regionally, and globally. Their voices accelerate ethical research and equitable access, and their oversight demands accountability so that interventions that work reach those who need them most. You can go to the next slide, Sinda. Yep. And so throughout a decade of the program, um, we've worked with 77 fellows from 14 countries throughout Africa and Asia. On the left hand, you'll see our current seven fellows that we're working with. And on the right, you'll see a picture, sort of a montage of all of the different fellows we've worked with over the year that we update um, as we include new folks into our fellows family. So that's a little bit of background, very quick on AVAC and, and what the fellowship is. We're gonna go into more specifics now about the program, what it looks like now, and frequently asked questions about applying and getting involved. So I'll turn it over to Sindra. Okay, hi folks. I'm just um, trying to do something here. Okay, so um, what is, the, first of all, again, warm welcome. And we do have some, um, some current and former fellows on the line today, and I'll get to that after we after this little um, introduction. Um, but I just wanted to say, um, what are the major goals of the fellows program? Um, well, you know that AVAC is a global advocacy organization for HIV prevention, and we're also starting to work on COVID and we're starting to work on TB as well. But really our focus is HIV prevention. And again, we're advocacy, so we don't do research and we don't do service provision, but we really, really try to work on policy and, um, and, any, and, and the legal environment, the research environment to make sure that um, HIV prevention gets to the people who need it. So very specifically about this program, its primary goal is to expand and strengthen the capacity of civil society advocates and organizations to monitor and help shape the global response to HIV prevention research and the rapid rollout of new and effective interventions in low and middle income countries with high HIV burdens. Advancing this goal requires a focus on biomedical, structural, social and behavioral considerations as well as linked epidemics such as TB and COVID. Um, so what does the Advocacy Fellows Program provide? If you were to be accepted to the program, it, we've extended it now to 18 months and you would get very intensive knowledge building, technical support from our team, from the AVAC team, mentorship um, and advocacy development. Um, throughout the whole 18 months, we would be working very closely with you to achieve your advocacy goals. 
um, you would get connection to our global network of HIV advocates. And again, we work in mostly in um, low and middle income countries, but we do have a strong focus on Southern and Eastern Africa. And because we're in the US, we also focus on the US and we have some programs in um, Europe as well. So you would definitely get financial support and I can go into the details later, but in just basically you would have your salary paid for a year and you would, in addition, you would get up to about around 12,000 US dollars to implement your project on top of your yearly salary. Um, and then you will be working through a host organization in your country and they would administer the grant. We would give them the money and they would administer the grant to you. And they would also get about 15% of your grant overhead. 15% of that would go to the organization. And then another 10% would go for any supervisory roles for the organization. And hopefully you would come out with an increased skill set, um, you know, which would help you with your communication skills, including media, project management, research, HIV research literacy, or even other types of research or other, or, other um, infectious diseases. And definitely you would increase your skills in advocacy and convening. So who can apply to be a fellow? Um, again, people who are focused in East, this year we're really, really focusing on Eastern and Southern Africa. We also work in Nigeria um, and we can make exceptions, but these, the reason why we focus on Eastern and Southern Africa is because this is where the highest HIV incidents are. Um, traditionally, this is where it's been. And, and because this is where, most of the HIV is the highest rates of HIV. That's also where there's most of the actual research into how to prevent HIV, for example, vaccine research or PrEP research. So these are the places we, we need to be. Um, so if you're an emerging or mid-career community advocate and you want to strengthen your skills in HIV, prevention and treatment, because we all know that treatment is prevention. Um, and again, the primary focus is HIV, but we also are um, allowing for COVID and TB to be integrated into the um, advocacy this year. You must be proficient in English um, and you have to have a demonstrated knowledge of HIV and COVID. You don't have to be an expert, we, but you don't, we, we're not looking for people who are brand new to the field. And again, you have to commit to be able to commit to 18 months. So this would start in April and go through September. So April of 2022 and go through September, 2023. Um, and so what can the projects, what would the projects look like? When, when we say projects, your advocacy project for the year. And all of the details you can find in the um, program, inf program information packet on pages five to eight, the details for the, these questions. So what project can an advocacy fellow propose? Basically, we'd like you to come in with very innovative, creative and exciting project ideas. And it needs to be somewhat focused on HIV prevention or treatment. It needs to be on HIV prevention and treatment, and it has to be an advocacy, um, an advocacy project, meaning you focus in on what are the gaps in your country, who are the people that have the power to fill those gaps and the money, and then you spend the year working towards those goals of filling those gaps. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll bring on some of the fellows who are on the call to, to talk about their particular projects. And also all this information, you can go to the website and see what people are working on now and you can get more than enough information about projects. So who's not, what projects are not eligible? We do not support or pay you to do your own service provision. If you're an organization that provides, for example, um, prep that, 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 provides prep or provides um, peer education or, or support groups. This is not advocacy, so we don't fund this. We don't fund research. For example, if you wanted to do behavioral research, we, we do not fund research programs. 
We work with researchers, but we don't fund it. We don't fund academic projects. And I just really wanna to stress to you, awareness raising is not advocacy. If your whole project is about, oh, we want people to learn about um, male circumcision. Everyone needs to know about male circumcision. This is not an advocacy pro project, that's awareness raising. And like I said, advocacy is when you, you see that there's some, a need that's not being filled and you, you go about trying to get that need filled by, by pushing the people with the power to fill it. Um, does an applicant have to know exactly what their project will be before applying? You'll notice in the, in the um, application that there is, there's a big uh, question about what would your project be? And we'd love, you know, of course we wanna see your ideas, but this won't be the end of your, um, this, what you submit is not gonna necessarily be the project that you do. We work with you to, to, to get a really strong project going, but we want, we're really interested in your ideas to begin with. Um, what is the role of the host organization? So the host organization is, there's you, there's AVAC, and the host organization is the, is the, um, the organization in your country that you will be housed at, basically. Um, so this is a physical organization. Um, so you can work from there. They have the financial infrastructure for administering the grant to you. So again, we give the grant to the organization and then they throughout the year administer the grant to you. So you'll be working according to all of their bylaws and all of their systems. Um, and they also are supportive of your, of your activities. And they're a very key part of your, of your year. You need to have a very supportive host organization. Um, they can be an organization that you're currently working at or volunteering at, as long as their mission somewhat aligns with HIV advocacy. Or they could be a totally new organization to you that you approach and ask if they will host you. And again, we just only ask that their goals of their organization align with HIV advocacy goals. Um, and it's, if, if it's important, whether it's a place that you already work out or a place that you wanna approach, it's really important that you have detailed discussions about the fellows program before you apply and have them commit to be on board if you actually do become a fellow. Um, so what types of groups can be a host organization? Usually it's a civil society organization. Um, traditionally it's not the government. Traditionally, sometimes it could be a, a research um, organization, but we, we're really, you know, we're advocates, we're civil society. We're not government um, representatives and we are not necessarily researchers. Um, these are the people we wanna push in our advocacy. We wanna push the government. We wanna push the researchers to do the right thing. Um, and we're not funders either. So you can't work for PEPFAR or the Global Fund or you know, the Ministry of Finance or Health. Um, and then there's the role of the host supervisor. And this is the point person at the host organization who's responsible for overseeing your work um, so you would have really, a, you would develop a strong relationship with this specific person at that organization and they would help you advocate within that organization and hopefully help you also within the field to do better advocacy. How are advocacy fellows and host organizations paid? Um, so again, you get a salary and that salary really depends on a few factors. It depends on what you're making now. It depends on what the going rate is in your country. Um, so we, we work with you closely to, it's all really, it's not a flat, it's not a flat salary across the program. It's, we work with you as an individual to see what's appropriate for your setting. And then um, the host organization, like I said, gets overhead. So they get about 15% and then about 10% 10, 10 goes to the person who, or the organization for supervising. Um, and if you have not found a host organization when you apply, first of all, we do weight or applications heavier when we see that they have a host organization. But in some instances, we have a very strong candidate who has not found a host organization yet. 
So this year we actually have a list of the past host organizations. Um, so you're more than welcome to go and look at these host organizations um, and maybe contact them. Or if you have another host organization in mind, we also have tips for how to approach a new host organization. So I don't know if you can see this. I'm gonna try to, um, oops, I'm gonna try to make it a little bigger, but this is an important, this is an important um, timeline. And I'm just gonna go through, you know, the, the application process has a lot of steps and a lot of documents. And this is sort of outlined here. So I'm just gonna go through it. So as you all know, we're, we're right now we're in the open call for applications. They are due October 12th. Full applications are due. Um, and there's um, a few documents that are needed with these applications. Um, and those are all in the application information packets. Um, throughout October, we will shortlist, um, we will notify the shortlisted candidates. Um, we're not sure yet how many will be shortlisted, but quite a, the, the strong candidates will be shortlisted. And that's at that time, we'll ask for additional financial information from the host organizations. And we will we'll want that within two weeks of your notification of shortlist. And then in November, we'll, we'll interview the shortlisted candidates and the proposed host organizations. And then October through December, we'll ask for fi the final financial information from the host organization. So we vet these host organizations. We make sure that they're, you know, that they're registered organizations, that they are able, that they have the infrastructure, that they have, you know, tax IDs, that they're actually a legitimate organization. So we need their information. Um, and then we also, we have, we tap external um, people to help us review. So we'll, we'll get people from your own countries to review your applications. We'll get former fellows and supervisors to review the applications and we'll, we'll check your references and we'll make a final decision. And then in January, we notify all of the new um, fellows and it's usually around seven or eight fellows that apply and we often have maybe 200 applicants. So it's highly selective program. And then January through March, um, we work with you to prepare um, your agreement. And we importantly, we work with you, this is the fun part, to get a work plan for your, um, and a budget for your advocacy, for the advocacy that you'll be doing the following 18 months. Um, and you, and because it doesn't start until April, so between January and March, we're going to ask you to work about three days on the work plan, and then we will re reimburse you with a stipend for that time. The fellowship will start um, April um, 2022, and I realized that we haven't updated this, and it will go through, this is not right, it says March 31st, it'll actually go through September, I believe, because so it's, it's 18 months. And then, um, we will also, in the very beginning, we'll have a, um, an orientation workshop in April to, to onboard everyone and to welcome everyone. So I'm gonna stop there, um, uh, but I also just want to draw your attention to, um, I hope you've all gone here, the fellows application materials, there's a list of them. And everything I just said is in all those materials, we strongly advise you to read through the materials. It'll give you a lot, it'll answer a lot of your questions and it'll better prepare you to apply. So with that, I'm actually going to um, try to stop sharing my screen. Hi, everyone. Um, and I wanna introduce you. I know that we have our former fellows. We have um, Bridget Juko from Uganda and she was, hi Bridget, welcome. And she was a fellow in 2019, I believe. It's hard to keep hi, hi, Bridget. <laughs> Welcome, Bridget from Uganda, from Kampala. And then we Thank also you. have another Ugandan from Kampala, the famous Moses, Moses Supercharger. Thank you, Moses, for joining us. Um, you were a fellow, I don't even know, 2017? 17. Yes. 17, yes. <laughs> All right, okay. And then I also believe that we have Josephine Aseme, who is a current fellow from Nigeria on the line. Um, if we have any other current or former fellows, please let me know. But um, just so that folks on the line can get a, a sense of um, 
of what it's like, just really briefly. Um, I want to ask you, um, how did you approach your application writing and why do you think you got selected to be a fellow? And any, any order, you can respond in any order. Moses, you're on, do you want to start? Uh, come again with a question, please. Okay, hi Moses. Um, so Moses, how did you approach your application writing and why do you think you got selected? And I know you have a very specific story about your application process. <laughs> you want to share it? Yes. Yes. First and foremost, uh, I got that fellowship in 2017 after applying for like five times. Right. Exactly. So the message I want I want to pass on to the folks who are trying to apply: if you don't get it the first time, don't lose hope. Keep trying. Keep trying. It's like chasing the most beautiful girl or a most <laughs> handsome boy. You don't give up easily like that. <laughs> if he says no, or if she says no, today, you try it tomorrow, you try it. So keep trying. Me, I tried four times failing, 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 failing. And one of the reasons why I failed is what Cindy had, had just uh, uh, explained. My application was always fantastic, but it was always off-site. Uh, it was basically sensitizing masses. I want to, to educate people, blah, 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 blah. So advocacy is not what? Uh, is not sensitization. It's not to do with sensitization, like Cindy has just put it. So that was one of my mistakes. There were several mistakes, but that was the major one until I learned the difference between advocacy and sensitization. So like Cindy put it, your application must be on advocacy, on advocacy, changing something, solving a gap, big gap in your, in your, in your area. Why was, it, why was my application picked? First and foremost, I'm a very energetic person and uh, I'm a very, very uh, passionate person about HIV AIDS. And yet the problem I put forward was really striving. Uh, Uganda had folks who were failing first and second line but they had no intervention at all. The country at all didn't have intervention, and yet it was already there yeah, in, in the developed world. So my advocacy was to uh, basically uh, push the government of Uganda and the partners introduce third line for those who are failing. Secondly, I was also advocating for community involvement into the ongoing HIV cure research. We know globally uh, there's a lot of research going on, but Uganda, was really behind it. So basically my advocacy was around that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Moses. And um, Bridget from Uganda, um, why do you think you were selected? And why don't you talk a little bit about your project as well? Just to, briefly, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sindra. Hi, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Bridget. So uh, my project was, um, was uh, was dealing with uh, uh, adolescent girls and, and young women. And uh, I'm sure most of us on this call know how important that category of group is. So uh, it was looking at advancing uh, their involvement, uh, looking at their participation. And at that time in Uganda, I remember that was around 2018, we were into uh, rolling out PrEP for the different populations in the country. And at that time, adolescent girls and young women were not uh, were not part of the population and they were not engaged. So my project basically looked at how do we advance their involvement? How do we put them in the middle, in the heart of uh, uh, the rollout? And you know, uh, you know what, what was happening in terms of PrEP introduction in the country. So I think my project was picked because one, you look at uh, the unique aspect of the project, but also uh, I think one thing I appreciated with uh, the fellowship is they, they really are in touch with someone's passion. If you are certain about what you're, you're, you're writing about, especially when you're writing your, your, your project, I, I would suggest that someone write something that you're certain this is something you are passionate about and you're going to give your all to do. I, if they gave me a project to do, let's say, QR research, I would not be as passionate as when I am working with adolescent girls and young women and when I'm working with PrEP. So focus on your passion. 
uh, look at the, the environment that you're in, especially, you know, in country, you look at, you know, what the trends are in terms of HIV prevention, as Sindra mentioned, when, uh, when you look at the application, read it and understand it. And Supercharger has also said, some of it, sometimes you, you have a very good application, but it's just, of course, it's not addressing what actually, uh, uh, you know, let's say the fellowship program is looking at. So me, I, I did read, I, I, I tried to understand, ask around, no man is an island, please do ask, uh, get ideas. I involved quite a number of people, you know, telling them what I wanted to do. And uh, uh, I think that helped me so much. But uh, most importantly, I really, really think uh, the project was picked because one, it spoke into the situation in the country in terms of HIV prevention. And uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, the fellowship program looked at it and saw passion one, but also to how it was going to then, uh, the outcome, the end outcome, how it was going to then, uh, you know, look like in the end, it was really, because when we talk about advocacy, you're talking about an, another bigger group. This is not just about you, but about, you know, the communities that we are serving. So that is it. Thank you, Cinder. Thank you so much, Bridget. And you just reminded me that, um, there's definitely countries where we have very big fellow alumni um, coalitions and a lot of prevention advocacy networks. And then there's countries where we haven't worked as much. For example, we have one fellow from Botswana, from Eswatini, from Lesotho, from Tanzania. And we encourage you to, if you're from those countries to apply, get in touch with the one point person and we would give you some special, some special, some love and special attention because we do encourage, you know, we have a very strong presence in Uganda and obviously in Kenya and um, Malawi and Zimbabwe and Zambia and even in South Africa. And, and so um, other, don't be discouraged if you're from another country and you don't see a big presence because we're trying to build up our presence elsewhere so that we can have stronger advocacy. So last but not least, Josephine Aseme is a current fellow. So I know that she's a 2020 fellow. We've extended theirs through 2021 as well. So Josephine, you with us still? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Han. You want to talk just a little bit about um, what your, ad, okay, your, your application process and what you're working on and why you think you were, you've chosen to be an, uh, a fellow? Um, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, basically, I'll say that one of the reasons why, uh, let me start from there. One of the reasons why I was um, selected on uh, my own case was because one, what I was actually, what I actually applied for was a need at that moment was a pressing need at the moment I sent my application as a fellow. Um, looking at the issue of um, PrEP, at that time um, in Nigeria, key population weren't having access to PrEP that much. And um, some, and basically some of the reasons that has to do with that low access to PrEP by key population was more of the structural issues that was affecting key population access to PrEP. And um, I worked with that to like apply. So my, my, my own application was, um, was more of putting uh, in place or advocating for policies and program that Nigeria need to consider to ensure effective um, prep um, service delivery for key population in Nigeria. And this uh, advocacy has to do with me targeting the, the key players, or should I say the, the, the people that has the mandate and authority to ensure that um, there are programs that are put in place or policies that are put in place to ensure key population have access to these particular um, services in Nigeria at that time. And uh, applying for being a fellow also for me had to do with something I already know how to go about it. 
So one, I, 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 need, I needed to understand my strengths and my weakness and understanding my strengths and my weakness, I needed to like find a host organization that would support me in terms of my weakness. So that at that point, it's being balanced. So in achieving a lot that I had within my project time was because I selected a good host organization that helped me push up with my weakness, looking at the context of Nigeria and how difficult it is for you to convince a policymaker or donor or partner to even buy into your program. So this was practically what really my program is really all about. And that actually helped in terms of me achieving my, my project um, expected outcome. Thank yeah. you so much, Josephine. Thank you so much. And I just want to add that Josephine, it was she applied, it was her second time applying and we had encouraged her after her first time. We said, you know, we really were impressed. Please try again. And she did. And then she got it. So with that, I think it's time for the Q&A and I'm going to hand it back over to Hannah. Thank you. Hi. Awesome. Great. So we've got about 20 minutes left for question and answer. Before we jump into that, and again, um, you absolutely can unmute yourselves and I'll call on folks um, to, there might be a lot of questions, so I'll, please wait until I call on you to ask. If you're able to, um, at the bottom of your screen, you can do something um, called raising your hand. And so, I, perfect, I see someone's already done that. Um, there are a number of folks whose name is actually not coming up on their screen. So it's gonna be a little difficult for me to, oh, thanks. I was just gonna show that, Sindra, but thanks. <laughs> um, so it's gonna be a little hard for me to call on you, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm gonna walk you through the applications page material. Sindra, do you mind if I share my screen? Cause it's a little blown up on yours. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Cool. So, um, this is the, I put the link on the chat function, but this is our applications page. If you go to avac.org slash fellows slash applications, you can see all of the process here and all of the materials that Sundra mentioned. Um, please remember, of course, that the due date is October 12th, 2021. You'll, we ask that you read through all of the materials, especially the program information packet before you submit the application. This is gonna be very important and actually probably will answer a lot of the questions that you all have today. Um, one of the questions that we already received that I can, that I can take in the chat was um, what parts do the applicant fill out and then what parts do the, the um, sorry, please do mute yourself if, thank you. Um, and then what parts do the host organizations fill out? So you, um, in, the, in phase one, the different parts of the application that are due will be the application information form, which was the first form on that list. Um, in there, you will add information about your host organization, just basic information. You'll ask essay questions. You'll also provide your resume. Then we ask for a letter of support from your host organization. And that is the part that the host organization will fill out. So they're not filling out any part of the actual application form. They will be submitting something separate, which is a letter of support. And again, you can find that all in the list that I just showed you. So I think we will start with some questions now. Um, we are, I'm going to go through some of them and Cinder and I will both answer them. So there's a number of them in the chat. Um, there's also raised hands and there's raised hands. So let's start with, um, one question it's the, it says, can leaders from small organizations apply for the fellowship? So. I can take a stab and then maybe Sindra, you can jump on and add some information. So normally we say that this is really for emerging and mid-career advocates. So if you are, for example, an executive director at an organization or in a high place in government or are very, um, how do I say, far along in your career, this fellowship probably isn't for you. This is to build so capacity support. This is to really help um, get folks can have folks continue on their journey in advocacy with that said we actually do have some executive directors or leaders of organizations that started josephine Aseme, one of our current fellows who spoke actually is an example 
of one of those. Um, and maybe Josephine, I'll invite you since we wanna integrate the current fellows on this call and answering the questions. Josephine, do you wanna give a sentence or two about how you were able to manage still being um, the director and in charge of an organization you started while managing the fellowship at the same time? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, first of all, um, what I did in terms of managing my organization at the same time working as a fellow, I had to apply to my board telling, before I even applied for the fellowship, I had also informed my board that I needed to go for this fellowship and this is the thought I'm kind of applying. And these are the reasons. And I also made it clear the, the benefits of me being a fellow will also uh, bring to the organization. So at that point, we actually had an understanding what I was going for. So the moment the fellowship came on board and I got it, I had to take up um, a leave, a one year leave, because at that point I had to make them understand my attention and money then in other fellow. But however, I will also be providing some technical or support to the organization at that point because I needed to put someone that um, that can support whatever I'm doing at the organization. But however, I did not resign. Neither did I ask somebody to replace me as the director, but rather the person was there just to support and it was my program officer actually, just to support whatever that was going on within that organization at that time. So within that one year period, I was more focused on my fellowship. I have, at the same time, I approved for every transaction that goes through the organization. It has to pass through my table I'll go through them to understand if it's relevant or not. If not relevant, I'll reach out to the board and say, this is not, this particular um, um, request might not fly, and these are the reasons why. So at that point, my organization didn't lose focus, neither did I lose focus, because I had already had someone that was there, and had someone someone that has that technical, um, technical um, skills to carry on um, the organization mission and whatever I've actually done within that period of time. So the moment the board gave me that one year leave, I started out of my project. And when uh, we had an extension, when we started talking about having an extension, I also had to reach out to them prior before time to make them understand that I will be having an extension of extra six months. And this is where the extension will be ending at that point. And I also and they quickly asked if I wanted to still go up with that extension. I said, yes, that I would want to use the opportunity to complete whatever I felt that I have not actually accomplished within this period of time. And that particular um, thing was done and I, it was documented. So that shows, yes, I didn't just wake up and start up that, but there was a process to that particular, the whole board had to agree to that. It wasn't just a one person in agreement. The whole board have to agree with, uh, with that. And that was how it worked for me. So at the end of the day, my organization wasn't failing and I wasn't also failing at, as, as a fellow while I do my work. Thank you so much, Josephine. That's really helpful. And just to add on to Josephine's comment, you'll see on page 18 of the information packet, it, it sort of gives a little bit more instructions um, for folks that do may have a full-time job or be leaders of an organization. Um, and this question I think relates is, can fellow a fellow work in their current job while being a fellow? So the short answer is no. Just as Josephine shared, um, the fellowship is meant to be the primary focus of the fellows 18 months. So fellows devote nearly 100% of their time to the fellowship. Of course, we can help you manage um, your participation in organizational meetings and support larger work as applicable, but this is really, you're receiving a full-time salary for the 18 months, and we do consider this your full-time job. Um, we don't have fellows accept other consultancies or other forms of employment during this 18 months with us. Can I, um, can I just right. in? So uh, I've see, I'm seeing, I'm looking at the questions in the chat and I'm seeing a lot of, um, well, what about LGBTQ and KPs? And let me just make it very, very, very clear. We are more than excited to work with KP led organizations. And it just so happens that this year it's very, very dominated by young women working on adolescent young girls issues. And of course we wanna continue because that's actually where there's a lot of HIV. And as we know, there's a lot of HIV in KP communities. And also the team has um, 
KP represent our AVAC team has KP representation on it. And we encourage, especially if you are a KP led organization, please do apply or if you're or, or align with a host organization that's KP led. And then I see a question that says under what conditions should an organization be able to host the fellow. I'm not quite sure what you mean by conditions, but um, Again, we have a lot of literature on our website about who's a, who's an organization, what's a host organization. So, but basically, it's usually a community um, or a civil society-led organization that is in part of a, a movement, and it doesn't have to be the HIV movement. It could be women's rights. It could be, um, you know, sex worker rights. It could be um, trans trans rights. It could be um, anything. Women, you know, any sort of social or economic justice movement um, you can, that are also wanting to um, wanting to uh, mobilize with the HIV movement. So basically it's it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be an HIV organization. Thanks, Sandra. We are having a bunch of questions right now and as I'm monitoring this exactly about, about the host organizations. And I really do encourage everybody on that page to visit um, the tab that says host organization materials and frequently asked questions because many of your questions are there. Um, one question that someone asked is, can a hospital's research system that handles advocacy projects be a host organization? Sandra, I'm going to let you take that one. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we would definitely. Um, uh, I could see where that would be um, relevant. So if you make the case in your application about what's, what the advocacy needs are, then um, yes, as long as you're, we're not, you know, as long as it's the funding is not going to supporting the hospital services, but if it's really just going to advocacy, then sure. And if it's advocacy that's outside of the hospital, I see another question that says, um, must the impact of the project be felt at the national or regional level? or the impact can also be felt locally on your main original, original primary focus? This is a great question. And we work across, we work from grassroots, which is you know, very locally felt, all the way through to the national and then even the regional. And we encourage you to, um, I mean, it's really dependent on your, on, your, on your own context and what's needed. And if you can make an argument that, listen, my, the thing I'm looking to change, it's really, it's local, it's in my city, or it might be regional. It might be, it might, it's East Africa. And so if you can make an argument where, you know, we work across, across the board. Great. Um, I also just got a private message, someone asking, and I do see a couple of hands raised and I'll go to those next, um, about what, about people, basically, is there room for folks that are working on advocacy for HIV positive individuals? And absolutely. Um, we have a couple of fellows right now that are working on um, services for folks living with HIV. Because we are a prevention organization, we frame this in, the ter in terms of treatment as prevention or TASP, or also U equals U, which is undetectable equals untransmittable. You can look at some of our materials online about the work that we're doing in that movement, having folks living with HIV AIDS really lead us in our prevention efforts, but there's certainly room for that. And we're absolutely encouraging applications, um, not only from folks working in that sphere, but who are living with HIV AIDS as well. Um, I see someone's hand raised. Unfortunately, I cannot see your name, but if you've got your hand raised, you're the only one left now. So you can feel free to unmute, unmute and share your question. I've asked, I prompted you to unmute yourself. So please go ahead. Hello? Hi. Hi, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good yes, morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Abdallah Adriano Momad. I'm speaking from Mozambique, especially here at Dampula province, uh, mainly at Mozambique Island District. I am a student. Uh, I'm fin a finance student of local development and international relations. Uh, like that, I have appreciated uh, the advertisement uh, through your website, and uh, it come it stimulated my interesting to be a member 
of your uh, organization. Uh, but I got some questions to put forward. I'm not. I'm not. You I mean used to to uh, to holding a meeting on a Zoom. That's why I have first a uh, big problem to associate myself into the meeting. But I, I would like, first of all, to know if uh, the applicant has to be associated with an organization or not. Whether it, it's someone as an individual uh, aimed to develop uh, the locality that lives uh, through the key uh, people of the H uh, B in, the, in order to draw project that will benefit uh, the key people will be acceptable or not. Am I clear? So I think I'm just going to rephrase your question to make sure that we understand it. I think you're asking, do applicants need to have be ho hosted by a host, a nonprofit host organization? Is that correct? Yeah. Or can they? Okay. So the, the very simple answer is yes. Um, that's a big part of the program for some of the reasons that Sindra described. You can also find more information about the role of the host organization. Again, they really provide support um, locally and their mission and work should be aligned with the advocacy goals you have. Um, they also are the ones that disperse your funds um, and to sort of manage, help us manage your project that way. Um, if you do not have a host organization, as Sindra mentioned, we do prioritize the applicants that come in. Part of what makes a strong application is saying um, that you already have a host organization. However, for those who do not, and they have strong um, strong proposals, we will help pair them. Again, that is on a case by case basis. And we strongly prefer folks come in with a host organization. But yes, long story short, you do indeed need a host organization to facilitate your project. So I just want to say okay. I want to say that um, a lot of we're getting a lot of questions about what is advocacy. And thank you, Bridget, for for um, pointing everyone to the website where it actually tells you, it actually provides you examples of advocacy um, on, on um, in the information packet. It actually has, it goes through what is advocacy and gives you lots of examples um, of what's advocacy and what's not advocacy. One thing we always say is, as Cinder said a couple of times, advocacy is not awareness raising. So I think that's a good place to start. It's coming to the folks in position of power to ask for something um, and to advocate for a specific change. Do, can, country, can the country have more than one fellow? So technically, yes, uh, this has happened in past years, though we do prefer to have one representative per country. Um, I think, Cinder, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in past years, when we have had two fellows in country, they've been working on kind of complementary projects. Yeah, we, we typically don't, and that would be an exception. We did, in Zimbabwe, we had two people working together on a joint project, but most of the times we don't. So you're basically competing against your compatriots. If you're shortlisted, and you know, usually we'll have shortlisted, we'll have like a lot of Kenyans and a lot of Ugandans and a lot of Zimbabweans, and they're basically competing against each other. Right. Um, Trevor, the activist, I love your name and your hand is raised. So go ahead and you can share your question. Um, okay, good afternoon and good evening, everyone, depending on your location. Hello. I am Trevor Hello. from Uganda. Um, my question is about um, if the applicant, uh, let's say is a passionate advocate and has been shortlisted, and this applicant is a student, for example, university student, um, can the student find, what is the arrangement between a student and, the, and, and AVAC? Yes, thank you. Again, this is one of those that is a case by case basis. The fellowship is expected to be 100% effort of your time, which is difficult if you're a full-time student. Sindra, I don't know if you wanna add more context on that. About being a student and a fellow at the same time? Yeah. So we don't encourage it and we okay. would make it, you know, we would, again, everything is very contextual. And so it'd have to be an individual conversation that the team would have with you. Um, people can do it, but again, this is a full-time job commitment. So if you're the kind of person who can do school full-time and do this work full-time, 
I don't, you know, we're not encouraging it, but have the conversation with us while you're applying. It's been done, but we, again, it's not, it's not ideal because we really do ask for your full amount of time. And the last question we're gonna take is from Doreen. Um, if you have additional questions that were not answered today, I'm going to put in the chat box um, the email you can reach out and we will make sure to respond. Doreen, would you like to share your question? Yeah, I would glad to share a question. So uh, hello everyone, uh, because I know we're in different time zones. So I hope everyone is fine. My name is Doreen from Kenya. And uh, personally, I, I am also kind of aware most of the people asking the question of advocacy and, and uh, awareness raising are from because I use heavily my social media in HIV and AIDS awareness. So now I am kind of in the middle when it comes to the advocacy and awareness. And can I bring in the work I am doing on social media uh, in creating awareness? to applying for this advocacy, uh, for, for this fellowship, because I'm kind of in the middle. Sure. Um, social media is definitely a tool, especially with you younger people. <laughs> it's definitely, it's an advocacy tool to get the message across. So we absolutely encourage um, the use of social media, but it all, you know, it, it all really depends on what, what is that message? What are you trying to accomplish? I don't know if that answers your question. We also work with the traditional media. So if fellows, we encourage fellows to, to, to establish relationships with their local and national media. And we help place opinion, draft and place opinion pieces and have broadcast interviews, et cetera. Great. OK, thank you. Thanks, Doreen. Um, so again, we're going to have to wrap up. It's the top of the hour. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can send them to fellows at avoc.org. Just want to be absolutely clear about next steps because we're still getting questions in the chat about how to apply. Um, I'm going to share my screen one last time and walk you through exactly what to do next. If you're interested, please visit this page, avac.org slash fellows slash applications. You'll see all of the materials we have here. The first place to start is to read the program information packet. It's very long. You can also take um, a look at some of the other the FAQs. You will start by filling out the fellows application. That includes essay questions, information about the host organization, why you want to be involved in the fellowship, and then you will also, in addition to this information pack, in, in addition to this application, you will provide in one email the application packet, your CV, and a letter from the host organization saying they are willing to host you, which you can find under host organization materials and frequently asked questions. That should all come in one single email. Please do not send them separately. One email with all of those three documents by October 12th at the latest. And we do encourage folks to send them as soon as they are available since we get a lot on October 12th and we'll be considering them on a rolling basis. So with that, I'm going to close out the call. Thank you so very much um, to everybody who joined us today. Please do reach out to us via email with any questions. Um, and Hello. We'll... Oh, Sam? Uh, I have a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. We, can, we, we wrapped up the question and answer because folks need to go more at the top of the hour, but we can take your last question. Go ahead, Sam. Okay, my name is Sam from yeah. Kenya, Nairobi. I'm okay. working with uh, LGBT organizations dealing with MSM. Yeah. I was trying to go through your fellow platform uh -huh. and I saw there was a lot of focus on young girls, adolescents and women. So I was asking if someone is working with the key population LGBT, mostly working with MSMs more, yeah. is that person eligible for the application? Absolutely. Um, so we really encourage KP-led um, advocacy projects and particularly folks from the KP community to apply. As Sindra mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if you were on the phone yet, Sam, or on the call yet. We do this year have a lot of focus on AGYW and prevention for young women and girls. Um, however, mm -hmm. that's just the makeup of what the year has looked like. 
we work at our organization, not only do we have K KP representation on our core fellows team, but throughout AVAC, we work with KPs um, quite regularly and that's an integral part of the prevention work that we do. So we not only accept that, we highly, highly encourage it. Um, and especially since we're going to be focusing a lot on structural issues and how that informs HIV prevention, those applications and applicants are more than welcome. So please do apply. Uh, thank you so much for the clarification. Of course. Thank you all. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.